Uh, everyone, uh, once again, thank you for being here for the first day of the uh, IPS e-conference 2020. And I would like to introduce our first group of presenters, uh, the continuum, sorry, try and read my own language, the continuum of interaction. Uh, and so that is uh, Carrie Berglund, uh, Guillaume, uh, Marangel, Marangelo, sorry, <laughs> Angela Perez, uh, Richard Gelderman, and Sarah Schultz. So take it away. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I am going to go ahead and let Carrie take the lead. Okay, thanks, Sarah and Anna, and it's good to see everybody. Um, most of you probably know me. I've been around for a long time, which is a nice way of saying I'm getting old. Um, so very quickly, I think Anna covered a lot of this. We're not going to say too, too much aside from that each of us five presenters will speak for about three minutes. I'm going to be keeping time on everybody. So that should make your job a little bit easier, Anna. Uh, and we will go with the question process that you laid out. So please just, if you have a question for us as we go along, just um, it in the chat. So I think we can move on to the next slide, Sarah, which is my opening. Um, I'm going to kind of set the stage for thinking about interaction as a continuum, and that is to encourage you to think about interaction in its many forms. So let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, the main concepts I'm going to cover, I kind of touched on one already. Interaction is not a single idea. It can take many forms from superficial to deep and meaningful and everywhere in between. And you probably, if you do live interactive programs, you probably already use these different types of interaction throughout your show without even thinking about it. So I'm gonna very briefly touch on that because I have two minutes left. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, first, I wanna talk a little bit about the word interaction or at least how I think of interaction since I'm the one uh, sharing my idea of interaction at the moment. So for me, interaction means that what the audience does or says directly affects what happens next. And that image there is designed to give you the idea that it's the presenter, the woman there on the left, sharing some ideas, but then the audience in the chairs is sharing ideas back, two-way communication. So to think about any inter interaction, it's not all verbal. It can be physical. It might be something practical that you wanna know. Raise your hand if you can hear me, for example, or you want to see if they're under understanding the concept. Use your arm to follow the sun as it moves across the sky is another example of that. And of course, verbal. So let's move on to the next slide. So to briefly cover the three main forms I'm gonna lay out, and again, it's a continuum. So these are just beginning, middle, and end as I see them. The superficial, you can use that as a good icebreaker. Um, when I do a planetarium show, I like to start with, raise your hand if you've been to this planetarium before, or raise your hand if you've ever been to a planetarium before. Um, and I do that for a couple of reasons. One is it's good feedback for me. How familiar are they with the planetarium setting? And it also gets them used to the idea that I'm gonna be asking them to interact throughout. It's like a little icebreaker or uh, training, if you want to call it that. And then medium, I might ask them to recall some earlier information that I shared. Uh, remind us how we use the pointer star to find Polaris. Or I might ask them for a simple deduction without explaining how that deduction was made. Um, if you ask for that deduction, that gets more into the deep, the analysis and synthesis of information. Um, so I might ask something like, do we all see the same moon phase on the earth at the same time? Get some ideas and then ask, how do you, how do you know that? Or why do you think that we do or do not? Ask the audience to process their reasoning. So that's the end of my time. And um, it's too much to go over in three minutes. I'm always happy to answer questions, but I am going to kick it over now to Guillerme. And I'm going to start timing you, Guillerme. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> uh, nice to meet you all. My name is Guillerme Marangelo. It's hard, I know. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about storytelling to story listening. And um, keep moving, Sarah. We really love storytelling in the planetarium, fixed or mobile however, and as the things that we love, we take care a lot what we are doing. And we love to do that with young kids, but today I, I'm gonna talk to you about another special program. Can move it, Sarah? A program led by two colleagues 
Cecilia Irala and Rafael Kimura. With elderly groups, we go to centers for old people and pick them up and bring them to the planetarium. And we just need only a few minutes and then we stop storytelling and we start story listening. They have so amazing stories that we have collected during the last two years that are just amazing. And our next step is to bring them back to the planetarium to tell their own stories about the sky to their own grandchildren. Not this year, but maybe next year. Thank you. The next one, Angela. Thank you, thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Angela Fo from the Planetarium of Medellin and I want to tell you some project special that we did last year. Um, Park Explorer and Planetarium are both located in one of the most important cities in Colombia. We work together to produce scientific content to engage audiences through something that we call memorable learning experience, not only to gain a specific knowledge, but also to share enjoyment with the people of the new discoveries. Uh, over the past five years, the Planetarium has, uh, has focused on producing immersive experience under its dome in order to recover the tradition of live shows and to remind the visitors that science is not only for scientists, but it's a very once right. In this slide that you are looking, after the success of those shows, we decided to take one step further. And in the last year, we developed a, a special project with seven people that you are seeing there, a biologist, a chemist, three astronomers, a teacher, I'm a teacher, and guided by a professional actor there to express a scientific anecdote related to our files through immersive images. In order to, to achieve that, it was necessary to develop new skills and concentrate on three special aspects. One of those was body expression. First of all, the face and the body communicate joy and comfort. We needed to learn techniques to share those feelings to the audience. The second one is telling a simple immersive story that it was the stories that are unrelated to one's life uh, can easily go unnoticed while specific an anecdotes that relate to real life and common situation can resonate better with the spectator, which is a key point in scientific communication. Voice te technique, that's the third one. Monotony is detrimental toward the attention and reception of the messages. For that reason, we conducted several ex exercises to project our voices more effectively and to be aware of our tones and play with them. And next slide, please. However, we have to keep in mind that the training does not end once the show is over. Further and constant practice allow science, science outreach and scientific to find their inner presenter. Moreover, we want people to interact di directly with the stories, not only by asking questions, but by deciding how the story takes place. The next, is, the next one, please. Over over recent months, due to COVID-19 restrictions, telling stories, keeping physical distances required that narration and navigation flows together, bringing down the cosmos to people during life shows. I think, and I leave it like that, thanks to our formal training, we were able to design and carry out new contents aimed to different audiences, which have guaranteed an, an active interaction between the presenter, the navigator, and the cybernauts, if we can call it like that. By answering this central question, how can we engage observers after a long day of high connectivity? That's the end, thanks. I think I, I step in the three minutes. You're up, Richard. Apologize, first technical glitch. Richard Gelderman, I'm at Hardin Planetarium in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And I think the more important thing is I have only been in the business for 12, uh, eight years since 2012. And when I agreed to take over our planetarium, I said that I would work about the uh, overhearing of, I love the planetarium, the best nap I've ever taken in my life was in the planetarium. Next please, Sarah. So 
what I want to do is I want the audience to get control, but I know that I can't just hand it over to the audience. There's a reason they're coming to me. And so we've spent time thinking over these uh, years about how can we hand things so the audience really believes they have control. And the idea is invisible fencing, having boundaries that the audience doesn't necessarily see. So I'm going to talk about two examples. Next, Sarah. The first example is your basic constellation show. And the boundary number one is that we hand them patterns like you see on the slide where I know this asterism, I know what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to name it for them ever by its Babylonian IAU name. Instead, they get to decide, but I'm going to have the asterisms picked out ahead of time, they don't get the entire sky, they get to name the asterisms that we choose. And then it's gonna be that I distribute them in a known order. And so I know when these asterisms get passed out to the audience, who gets what set of asterisms, what set of patterns means that I have control because it may be quietly in my head, but I know who has what patterns and I know it by the name that I know it. And then three is I seat them. We happen to be in a concentric flat old uh, spitz dome, but the, uh, the seating would be uh, however it would make sense for them to see it on the dome sky when I ask them to identify in the dome sky. So they get control because they get to make up a name for it. They get to make up what they see in the dot to not, dot to dot connection, and they get to decide why this deserved to be in the sky. But I still set up my own set of boundaries, which makes it manageable for us and honestly makes us look kind of magic. Next, Sarah. So we upped that a little bit and added more astrophysics where you could go in and you could say, tell me about that star. What's the story for that star? And the, um, the idea first is we'll limit the number of stars. 50 stars still seems like a lot of stars in the sky, um, but I can be as bold as something like 100. We've never ever shown more than 100 stars. I can also limit the number of stories that I'm going to respond to if someone asks about a, a star. And so I've got three listed here. One would be things that they expect, factoids, distance, luminosity, apparent brightness. But the other would be a story that I can put into a tale, something about where it is in its stellar evolution, how big it has gotten depending on how I know its place in the HR diagram and its stellar type. And then if I get trapped because they pick a star that I really don't know much about, I can always go for something nearby in the sky and say, oh, that's a fantastic star to have picked. It happens to be right next to, and then I save myself by going to something I know. Thank you. All right, well, um, I'm the last one here. So let's see, I've set my timer so I make sure I stay in time. So I am gonna be talking a little bit more about that deeper interaction in terms of formative assessment. So what, the way I think about formative assessment is really this interaction for learning. So let's take a look. Um, for those of you who don't know, I just recently finished my uh, doctoral degree in science education and it was on formative assessment. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> um, and so we're looking at deep interaction. My, the thought that I had was, you know, if we want to be able to teach our audiences better, and we all want to engage our audiences, but we can use what we're doing to engage our audiences to also help them remember what we're doing. Um, because we only have that little bit of window of time to interact with our audiences and then they're gone again. Um, and so I wanted to know if there was any um, teaching strategies that people are using in classrooms that have been research based and classroom tested that we could use in the planetarium as well. And the thing that came to the forefront was this formative assessment in terms of active learning. So interactivity is active learning. We are teaching actively in the planetarium. Um, and if we can use formative assessment, which is a part of active learning, then we can actually help our students remember what we're doing a little bit better. So 
formative assessment is assessment for learning. You're assessing what they understand and what they know as you go. And specifically, I was looking at strategic questioning. We ask questions, we ask lots of questions. We wanna interact with our audiences. And so we can use those questions that, that, that we're already doing and take it a little bit deeper so that we can try to get those, those interactions to be a little bit more uh, meaningful and help us guide our presentations based on the understanding of our audiences. So we can kind of address some of those misconceptions that they're coming in with and we can really help to, them to learn better. So what do I mean by this formative assessment and these, these the strategic questioning? Well, we wanna look at why and how questions. So instead of just asking things for them to remember and regurgitate, we wanna say, well, what do you think? Why do you think that? Here's an example. Let's say we have a teacher speaking here. Do you see any evidence that there's life on this planet? The students respond and they say, yeah. The teacher says, okay, well, what do you see? that makes you think that there's life on this planet. The students say land. The teacher could then say, yes, you're right. Well, land says that there, there's gonna be maybe animals and plants and trees. But instead this teacher says, well, why? Why do you think land actually might mean that there's life there? What evidence do you see? Or what do you think might cause there to be life if there's land? And so you're really digging in deeper into what these students understand and what they know, and you have more of an opportunity to, to engage with them in a more meaningful way. And that's four seconds. This is all of us. We have time for questions. We wanted to leave it open. Yep, there's my timer. And we are done talking. So where are your questions? <laughs> thank you, you everybody. Guys, thank you. You guys did great. Good work with that. Um, so, so far in the chat, uh, I have, just gotten one question, um, Guierne, uh, do you uh, video record elder stories? Do you have a format that you ask them to follow? Hi, we don't video record them. We just take notes from what we learn in their stories. And we just don't need to ask them. They just start telling their own stories and it comes. Great, thank you. If anybody else has questions, fire them over in the chat. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, if you're not comfortable sending them to the whole group, you're welcome to send them privately to me and I will pass them on anonymously. Uh, let's see, uh, how can we see the Cosmos monologues? Yes, of course. Uh, we create like seven stories, different stories, because we were different areas of the knowledge. Uh, we decided to tell the story in different way because it, it, it born with an idea and an anecdote. And that's why, uh, because we wanted to, to prove ourselves that we can express as a real presentators because we are not presentators. We learn from an actor we, and we, uh, when we did it, we are realized that the interaction between the, the audiences in the dome with the presenters can be different. Because if we tell stories that they understand really because they're, they're real situation and common things, at the end, when we went to the terrace, uh, the people look for the presenters, presenters and speak with them, ask questions and, and get a little bit deep about the topics. Now we're going to record it to make to upload it in a in a post postcast in a podcast. So we are just experience that and make more more content. Thank you. Um, if you uh, also have a link that you could share with us um, uh, with more information about the the Cosmos monologues. That would be fantastic. Uh, you can post the link in the chat um, so that everybody can grab that link if you have something to link to as well. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as we get something new, because uh, the, the, the program is in the page, in our page, Planetarium of Medellin, mm -hmm. that org, but it's not the content because that was just for live shows. But for sure, when I get the other step on that content, I'm gonna share with you, thank you. Great, thank you. And we have one minute left, so we're gonna try and get this last one in. Uh, 
Guillerme, have you had problems with the elderly not being able to see the stars? I think that was directed at you, at least. Um, but in general, have has there been problems with the elderly not being able to see the stars, and how do you work around that? So oh, we, we didn't have any problem with that yet. OK, excellent. Uh, and with that, uh, we have reached the end of our first session.